Now, we've talked about the concept of holiness in worship, and I define holiness very differently. I believe biblically, but very differently than certain people do and others do. I believe holiness, H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S, is synonymous with holiness, W-H-O-L. L-I-N-E-S-S, <laughs> holiness. I was, I was trying to remember whether or not there was two L's. I said, I'm pretty sure there is, but holiness it, with your entirety. And we talked last week about the fact that holiness in worship is synonymous with fidelity in the marriage bed. And wasn't it wonderful when you saw how the Word of God brings that concept out? Wasn't that marvelous, you know? And I'm telling you, when you let Scripture answer Scripture, it really is beautiful. It is amazing when you see how it all kind of interlocks and comes together and how God has painted this gorgeous mosaic. And when you let Scripture answer Scripture, instead of trying to add man-made definitions and right. to terms, you know, and creating definitions out of thin air, uh -huh. well, holiness is God's standard of living for His people. No, there's no such thing. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing. I'll tell you why I say that. Like I said Sunday, because you don't ask a baby to go out and drive a car. That's right. No. God's standard is that you approach Him sincerely. He said, God says, I desire truth in the inward parts. As long, that's sincerity. Right. As long as you're sincere, and you're sincere in your pursuit of God. And the Word of God said, follow after peace with all men and holiness. So, holiness is not something you attain. Holiness is something you pursue. Right. Mm-hmm. Just like following peace with all men. You may, there's no way in the universe you could be at peace 24 hours a day with everybody everywhere. Sometimes you're driving your car, you're not 500 feet from the church, you're full of the Holy Ghost and feeling good, you heard a good message, and somebody pulls out in front of you, and bless God, you want to just tongue lash them and cuss them and... Now, I don't know anybody that does such a thing. <laughs> but the, the reality is, we it is impossible. There are some people that you're just not going to be able to be at peace with, Brother Martin. You'll come out of Walmart, and some nutcase is going to want to cause trouble with you and argue with you and make, you know... And it doesn't matter how sweet you try to be, it doesn't matter how nice you try to be, it doesn't matter how you try to de-escalate the situation, that person is just out of their mind, and they're just going to be crazy, and that's all there is to it. So therefore, God said, follow peace with all men, pursue it. Doesn't mean you're always going to get it, but pursue it. The same thing is true of holiness, the same thing is true of giving God your all. Pursue that. Strive to do that. Doesn't mean you're always going to do it, but that's the pursuit you should be in. That's right. Every day you walk with God, you should be pursuing a greater depth of commitment, a greater depth of dedication Amen. to the Lord. Amen. Just like marriage. When you get married. Now, I can tell you, I, I, I'm going to try to be nice tonight. I have family members. They went into marriage from day one with no intention in the universe of being faithful, with no intention in the universe of being monogamous. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? They went in from day one and had every intention of doing whatever they good and well felt like doing outside of the marriage bed. But then you get other people who get married and... That's not to say that they're not tempted. That's not to say that, you know, others don't catch their eye or get their juices flowing, if I can use that term. But they made a, a commitment. They've made a commitment. I'm going to give my marriage my all. And every day you've got to work at that. Mm -hmm. Every day, you, do you follow what I'm saying? Every day you've got to give your marriage your all. You can't give your marriage your all. The problem in our society today is half of our marriages end in divorce because people give their marriages their all 
for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, instead of our all, it's 90%. Instead of our all, it's 80%. Instead of our all, it's 70%. And by the time we're done, it's gotten down to maybe 20%. And all right, I'm over it. Let's head for the courthouse. You follow what I'm saying today? Yeah. So holiness has to do with giving God our, our all. If you notice, uh, one of the passages that I used in this exhortation early on was Acts chapter 2. And we're going to use this tonight, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And people would say, what in the world does this have to do with holiness? Well, you'll see. Mm -hmm. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, not in their homes, singing to themselves. Not at home, worshiping the I can worship the Lord by myself. Hallelujah, glory to God. No, with one accord in the temple. We talked about location. And breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We see a picture here of the early church. Mm -hmm. And in this picture we see two really blatant realities. Number one, you see people who have given God holy everything. Mm -hmm. They're worshiping God daily. They're spending time together with one another. They're having meals together. If anybody has a need, the other one meets the need. Nobody goes without because, bless God, we're a family and we're going to make sure. And that's how this church tries to conduct our business. That's why it's been our policy since day, if you know me at all. You know from day one I've said, if somebody comes to church and we go out to fellowship afterwards and they don't have money to eat, we will find a way to feed them. If somebody in the congregation happens to be blessed, has a few extra bucks, oftentimes they'll pick up the check. A lot of times Tommy and or I will pick up the check. If, if nothing else is available, we'll take it out of the general treasury of the church. Mm -hmm. I use the church's uh, debit card, you know, and we'll pay for it that way. But one way or the other, Everybody's going to participate. Why do I do this? I do this, honestly, Martin, for this reason right here. I'm not asking everybody to go out and sell everything you own and lay it at the apostles' feet and let us distribute it. But at the same time, the principle of making sure all needs are met, that principle is something I believe strongly in. I've believed in that since the first church I ever pastored at 19 years old. And I'm telling you folks, I've been doing this for 31 years. Every church I've ever pastored, we had the same exact policy. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this all these years. So the first thing we see in this picture in Acts 2, for, uh, 42 through 47, is a group of sold out people. Mm -hmm. Dare I say, a group of holy people. Mm -hmm. They are committed to the apostles' doctrine. Uh -huh. They want to keep their beliefs right. They want to keep their doctrine right. They want to keep their doctrine straight. Well, what is the measuring stick whereby we know our doctrine and our beliefs are accurate and true and correct? Is this something the apostles taught? That's the answer right there, folks. That's it right there. If it is not, throw it out. Mm -hmm. Well, Martin, I'm sorry to tell you, there goes half of the Lutheran faith. <laughs> <laughs> there goes 98.9% .9 of the Catholic faith. 
There goes 70% of the Presbyterian. Do you follow what I'm saying? Why? Because you get all this tradition that comes in. You get all this ceremony. You get all this ritual. None of which has anything to do with one word the apostles taught. That's right. Amen. If you cannot find it in the apostles' teaching, throw it away. Christianity, Paul talked about the fact that he was fearful that people would be removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. The, the Christianity is actually a very simple faith in reality. It is. It's a simple faith. There aren't a bunch of secrets. There aren't a bunch of mysteries. There aren't a bunch of rituals and practices. No. We don't have a litany of things. No. Christianity is a simple thing. You hear. You believe. You obey. There you go. Boom, boom, boom. Now you're in the faith. You're baptized into the body of Christ. Now you're in the body. Now what do we have to do? Now we want to grow. Because God didn't want a bunch of stagnant trees out there. He wants people who grow and bear much fruit. So we want to grow. We want to be a testimony. We want to be a witness. A lot of what is taught in the New Testament church does not have diddly squat to do with heaven or hell. It has to do with letting your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's why if you notice the apostles, they, they don't spend, if you read the epistles, you do not constantly see warnings about hell. Mm -mm. No. My grandmother used to judge a preacher by whether or not he preached hellfire and brimstone or not. But if he preached hellfire and brimstone, he was a good preacher. If he didn't, he wasn't. And when she told me after I came into affirming ministry and God taught me a few things, I talked to her and said, well, we had a guest preacher today. I'd say, well, was he any good? Oh, yeah, bless God, he preached against sin. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. What do you mean you're sorry? I said, I'm sorry for you if he preached against sin. I said, that must have been a terribly boring message for you. After all, you're a child of God. You put your sins under the blood. <laughs> you believe If you're a child of God, you believe if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Boom! Sin is dealt with. Hallelujah! It's finished. It's over. It's done for the believer. <laughs> said, oh, was he preaching on a street corner? No, he was preaching in the church. Oh, okay, well, he must have been standing on the front porch then to make sure he caught all the sinners coming by. Oh, no, he was in the pulpit. Well, then why did he preach against sin? Are God's people so feeble and so weak that we are constantly, forever and always, falling into one sin after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, after another that we got to be reminded, Martin, every Sunday, what sin is, how to avoid it, how to get over it. Listen, I grew up in Pentecostal churches. I'm telling you, I don't think folks appreciate our little church and what we've got going on these days. You don't see me trying to preach people into an emotional uproar so they'll come down to the altar and weep for six hours over how miserable and unholy and ungodly and wicked they are. Mm -hmm. No. Let me tell you something. A one God believe in Jesus' name baptized, Holy Ghost filled believer ought never, ever to have to be preached into that frame of mind. That's right. Oh. That's right. Amen. Never. Amen. Never. Amen. Never. Amen. No. When you look, and we're going to talk about it here in a minute. When you look at worship and the nature of worship, worship is supposed to be rejoicing. Uh-huh. Brother Jack, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I've watched some videos on, on YouTube. Pentecostal churches, all people getting in the spirit. And you know what I've learned? You know what I've come to realize? A lot of it spooks me. 
people contorting and twisting like somebody's pretzelizing them. Got these looks of horror on their face. That's not Holy Ghost worship. I'm not saying they're not in the spirit. I think they are. I think they're travailing in the spirit. I think they're mm -hmm. they're interceding in the spirit. But that's not worship. Just like I tell people all the time, don't don't go to God in prayer and tell them how ugly and dirty and filthy and miserable you are. I mean, they know nothing worshipful about saying that. You're not worshiping God telling him what a miserable wretch you are. That's not worship. No. Do you think a husband coming home telling his wife, I'm the worst husband ever going to be? I don't know how you could ever love me because I'll tell you, I'm the worst husband that ever was. I don't know how to treat you right. I don't know how to do you right. Well, honey, you deserve somebody a whole lot better. Well, he keeps talking like that. She's going to go find herself somebody again. <laughs> right. But there are a lot of Christians who come to God with that frame of mind. There. There's presumed guilt. You, you come to God and you're just constantly in this state of guilt. Need I remind you, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Didn't say who walk not after imperfection, but in perfection. <laughs> to walk after the Spirit doesn't mean you have to be perfect. But it means you're pursuing holiness. Oh, hallelujah. And when you're in the pursuit of holiness, I'm telling you, I want to shout and run a little bit. Next church building we get, I swear to God, I'm going to make sure we have good white owls. I'm telling you, we used to have some service and when we were over here. Uh -huh. Woo, Lord Jesus, I wanted to drop that mic and run. It felt like I had rockets in my trousers pushing me. I wanted to run. If y'all knew me back in the day, you'd know when I was preaching that, that could happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, not in the modern day Pentecost. Bless Lord, my preachers, they know how to keep their composure, Brother Derek. Well, sure they do. They're preaching a bunch of crap. <laughs> Why in the world should you get happy over preaching the garbage you preach? Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing happy about it. But I'd be preaching, I mean to tell you, that happiness in the Holy Ghost, the joy of the Lord. Paul said it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what Pentecostal worship is supposed to be. Uh -huh. the joy of now you ever see people shout joyfully? You ever see people get happy joyfully? You ever see them dance joyfully? That's what Pentecostal worship is supposed to be. It ought to be an expression of joy. Amen. I think there's a reason why God had moved in certain ways in our church as of yet. Because people need to understand some things. Yep. Let the joy of the Lord manifest itself in the house of God. Amen. All right, so we see people who are sold out. We see people who are holy, who are committed entirely to God. They want to keep their doctrine right. They want to keep their beliefs right. So what's the measuring stick they use? Did the apostles teach it? They continued steadfastly. That means with undying commitment. To what? The apostles' doctrine. And to break in your bread and fellowship and prayer. Now those last three things all have to do with the interaction of the saints. Mm -hmm. It all has to do, the last three things all have to do with corporate conduct. Uh -huh. And when you read this entire passage, mm -hmm. it's not talking about how believers behave individually. Mm -hmm. It's talking about how the church behaved corporately. Uh huh. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Now, here's the second. Here's the second facet to what we see in this passage. We see a church that God is blessing. Mm -hmm. We see miracles happening. Mm -hmm. We see people being saved and being added to the church. Uh -huh. Oh my God, have uh -huh. mercy. Yes. Uh-huh. 
You know why the devil wants you to believe you don't need to go to church to be a Christian? Because if he can distort the concept of the need for corporate worship and corporate activity, he can rob us of our power. Our power as the church of the living God is in our corporate nature as the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's right. You see these people worshiping God every day, going to the temple every day, getting together, having meals, going and fellowshipping one with another. And what else is happening? What else is happening? They have favor with all the people. Mm -hmm. What else is happening? And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Woo, what I wouldn't do to have people get saved every day. Mm -hmm. What I wouldn't do to have people being converted and filled with the Holy Ghost every day, Brother Jack. Oh, not just on Sunday, not just on Tuesday. No, every day. Wouldn't that be exciting? We got people can't even find the time to go to church on Sunday and go to Bible study on Tuesday. But bless God. Look at the early church. I don't wonder why we don't see the move of God in the modern Pentecostal church like we used to. I don't wonder for one minute. I, it doesn't, I don't have a problem with it at all. Because we don't look anything like this. And until we look like this. And I got news for you, apostolic pastor, full of your legalisms and your rules and regulations. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You need to preach that God's people look like this. Uh -huh. Yeah, amen. Uh -huh. Not that they look like this and this and this. Because this and this and this doesn't bring the power of God. This does. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Woo, I want to shout. Yes. I preached for a United Pentecostal church in Mississippi several years ago. I was then who I am today. It was after I had come into a firm ministry. They didn't know anything about my background or anything. The pastor met me. He said, there's something about your spirit that I like. He said, I don't normally invite preachers. I just met to come into my pulpit, but I won't ask you if you'll preach for me tonight. He asked me on a Sunday, but I went to visit his church on Sunday morning. I was visiting Mississippi. I had a a lady friend, a girl I knew down there, and I was visiting with she and her son, and I, uh, sh uh, she brought me to this church, and he said, I want to invite you to preach for me tonight. I said, okie dokie. <sighs> I preached for him that night, and I preached the message that I titled, Truly Apostolic. Truly Apostolic. I said, you want to know what the earmarks of are of a people who are genuinely, truly apostolic? This was my text. Uh -huh. oh. Not 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> oh. Uh -uh. oh no, somehow or another I didn't bring hair, makeup, and jewelry into the equation. No, I preached this passage. I said, truly apostolic. There are four earmarks of genuinely, truly apostolic people. Number one, they contend for the apostles' doctrine. Mm -hmm. Number two, they break bread together. Number three, they pray together. Number four, they fellowship. Mm -hmm. And they're one. They're united. One. The Word of God said they continued with one accord. Mm -hmm. That's funny. One accord is what happened in the first couple of verses of chapter 2. And what happened when they were in one accord? The Holy Ghost came. <laughs> what happens when they continue in one accord? It keeps, on. it keeps moving. The Spirit of the Lord keeps moving. God is still able to move in the midst of them. God is still able to use them. God is still able to bless them. I preached from this text. That was my message. During my message, I talked about, they continued with one accord. I said, here I was in the heart of Mississippi. Mississippi. I'm telling you, I've taken my life into my own hands and didn't even know it. 
But this is the nature of prophetic ministry. Mm -hmm. I said, let me tell you something. God's people are not divided on lines of race. The color of a man's skin does not divide us as the people of God. And I turned to that pastor and I said, Brother, he had about probably 10 or 12 black folks in his church. The rest of it was white. This in Mississippi. I mean, that was miraculous in and of itself. I turned to that pastor and I said, I'm telling you, brother, you listen to me from the Holy Ghost right now. I said, if the United Pentecostal Church is even thinking of coming in, with a black minister and taking these wonderful people of color that you've got in your congregation so they can start a separate black congregation, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. <laughs> you are not acting in one accord. You're not walking in fellowship. You're not walking the way truly apostolic people walk. Mm -hmm. The pastor, I kid you not, began to weep, tears streaming down his face. After the service, he said to me, that's exactly what the United Pentecostal Church had planned. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not going to let it happen. I'm going to keep our church. I'm going to make sure our church stays a diverse church. I'm going to make sure our church stays a multiracial church. He said, brother, if ever I've heard from a prophet of God, I heard from a prophet of God tonight. That's the nature of prophetic ministry, folks. There are times they get up and preach things. I don't even know what I'm saying, but God knows what, he's, what I'm saying. He knows why he's put it in my spirit to say it. I want to tell you, there is power in corporate worship. There is power in corporate church activity, not even just worship, even in fellowship. That's why, that is why it is so important to me that people be able to participate in fellowship after the church. I've had people leave our church because they got offended with me, because they felt like I pushed too hard for them to participate in the fellowship afterwards. I know what I'm doing. You need it. Trust me. Uh huh. Uh huh. You need the fellowship. Yes, you do. Brother Jack and I come from a different background than most of y'all. We remember the day when Pentecostal folks, you practically had to use some kind of shear or something to pull them apart. Once we got together and got to talking about the Lord and got to praying and got to experience it, honey, we didn't want to we didn't want to leave. You had to almost pull us apart. I remember as a kid, my grandparents used to have church folk coming by the house. You know, back in the day, people actually used to visit one another. I got news for you, folks. Wouldn't hurt you to turn your computer off. Uh huh. Right. Amen. And go visit a believer. Mm -hmm. Spend some time talking about some good things. Mm -hmm. Encourage one another. Amen. Yeah. Exhort one another. Let that brother know who tells you that he decided to cuss somebody out on his way out of the churchyard. Let him know that's okay, brother. You're, you haven't lost your salvation. God hadn't given up on you. All you got to do is repent and say 45 Hail Marys and a couple of... <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, I'm, you know, I'm being, I'm being jovial, but I'm being honest, folks. Let me tell you something. You have no idea the power we've lost in the church because God's people no longer go house to house eating their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. That's right. I'll go to visit Mount Dorothy in Fort Worth sometime. And there have been a number of times I'll leave her house and we'll pray before I leave and she'll say, man, I'll tell you what, this... This was ordered of the Lord today. He said, man, God was in this. She said, man, I needed this. This was good. This, 
All we did was talk about God. All we did was talk about the things of God. Amen. Oh, there you go, guys. That's all right. This is my gorgeous little girl. We're talking about the power in corporate worship and corporate activity on behalf of the church. When God's people come together and we function as a body. I got news for you, children. You can have the most wonderful hand that ever was. But if that hand isn't connected to the arm and that arm isn't connected to the, to the, uh, the shoulder and if that shoulder isn't connected to the torso and that torso isn't connected to the legs and all of that ain't connected to the head, it don't matter how wonderful your hand is, it is worthless. Uh -huh. The devil knows that the power in the church is in our corporate activity. Uh -huh. When you bring God's people together for, for any purpose, you can bring them together eat a meal, mm -hmm. and the devil starts shaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. The devil starts shaking. You know why, brother? All it takes is two or three to agree on any one thing, and God said he'll do it. That's right. That's right. That's right. I've been somewhere with other people. We're visiting other folks, other Christian folks. All of a sudden, they get some bad news. You know what? That's all right. <laughs> you got other folk here to pray with you about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Boom! The devil gets a black eye before that news has a chance to even hit your, hit your eardrum. That's right. You're able to approach it with faith and trust in God. If you didn't have that saint next to you, you might have gone into a dismal spiral. You might have begun to think negatively. You might have begun to think in a different way. But because you got believers around you. Mm -hmm. All right. right. My goodness, have mercy. Mm -hmm. Yes. I got to go to the doctor. I got test results coming. Oh, Lord, I don't know what he's going to tell me. I, I found this tumor. I found this grove. I, I found this cyst, whatever the case might be. Oh, the doctor's going to tell me today, ask a brother or sister to go with you. Yes. Amen. I've got to go in for a test. Ask some of God's people to go with you. Oh, I'm going to tell you. I remember doing a work in Pennsylvania many years ago. This little 89-year-old lady baptized her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. On a Thursday night, she went in Friday morning for surgery. Heart surgery. Open heart surgery. Oh. Doctor said that two of her valves were all messed up. She had to have two of her valves replaced. She had to have a uh, what do they call that little shocker thingy? Pacemaker. Pacemaker installed. She had been on heart medication for years. The doctor said that if she did not have this surgery, she'd live at best a couple months. Told her family she probably, to be honest, may not survive the surgery. Her heart was so bad. Said, but without the surgery, she's not going to survive at best a couple of months. So they decided to take the gamble. 89 years old. <laughs> Baptized her in Jesus' name on Thursday night. Using a, another Jesus' name church's baptistry. A church in uh, about 40 minutes away from where I was at. Where we were doing the work. The pastor let us use his baptistry. We pulled that little 89-year-old old lady up out of that water. Before I baptized her, I said, <coughs> Sister Bowser, I want to tell you something. There is power in the name of Jesus. I said, we're burying your sin. I said, but honey, I got news for you. We can just as easily bury your sickness. <laughs> she said, I believe that. We baptized her. I'm not kidding. The other pastor from that church helped me because she was so frail and you know we were on either side of her and we 
brought her gently down to the water. You know, let her down, brought her gently up. And we had to let go of her body. I kid you not, you could feel the electricity, like literally, like somebody put an electric cord against her body. We couldn't even touch her. <laughs> and Brother McCoy and I put our arms around like this so she wouldn't fall back into the water. Probably electrocute herself to death. <laughs> you could feel the power of God all over that woman. The next morning she's going for surgery. She asked Jason and I, would you all come with me? My daughters, two of my daughters are going with me. One of her daughters was in our church, Sylvia said my other daughter who's not in church is going as well my granddaughter's going as well so would you and jason come as well i said yes ma'am we'll be there you're you're in surgery we'll be outside see i'm gonna tell you there's nothing wrong with you going through something like that asking god's people would you mind coming and being in the waiting room and praying for me while i'm in under the surgeon's care mm -hmm. yes. nothing wrong with that no. Don't, don't ever hurt pastor's feelings if you ask me to be there when you're going through a procedure when you're going to get test results doesn't hurt my feelings it's my job before she went in to prep for surgery she said pastor can you just anoint me with oil and pray one more time I said yes ma'am and it did they brought her in for surgery to prep her and get her ready and all that and literally about an hour later they come to me uh, they come to the place where we were all waiting and they said well your mother is upstairs in a room Sylvia said upstairs in a room what in the world are you talking about upstairs in a room said they said this surgery was going to be four or five hours at least they said she'd be going into recovery for a day or two afterwards at least what are you talking about? She's upstairs in the room. The nurse said, ma'am, I don't know. All I'm telling you is what I've been told. <laughs> so we go upstairs. Uh, we go right on past the ICU unit. We go right on past the post-surgery unit. We go upstairs into the general population area, you know. And we're walking down the hallway to the room number they give us for Sister Hazel and out comes a doctor from the room and he looks toward us and he sees Sylvia and her sister and me and Jason and the granddaughter and he literally kind of yells because he was oh probably 30 feet away I don't know what this lady's been eating all her life but bless God it sure works for her as we got closer Sylvia said what do you mean what are you talking about he said we opened her up Listen, I, I, I saw this in my own eyes. I didn't hear this second hand. I was there. He said, this woman's heart is perfect. There is not one thing wrong with her heart. Nothing, nothing, nothing. The unbelieving sister said, you got to be crazy. Why, two specialists recommended her. She had to get signed off on by two heart specialists to get this surgery. You're telling He said, I'm telling you, that woman has the heart of an 18-year-old girl. Her valves are perfect. The muscle is perfect. He said, there ain't nothing wrong. She said, well, did you at least put in the pacemaker? He said, you don't get me. She don't need it. Sylvia said, oh, hallelujah. She just started giving God the praise. She knew. Her sister standing there with her mouth wide open, giggling. Oh. <laughs> the rest of us are starting to give God the glory. We knew what all went on. We knew what was going on. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's power when God's people get together. And the devil knows it. If there's anything the enemy will try to do, you know, the Word of God says, Satan, like a roaring lion, roameth to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. If there is anything the enemy will do, he hunts like a lion. Mm -hmm. And listen to me. How does a lion hunt? He tries to separate and divide, and he will go after the weakest he will go after the youngest. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I can worship God at home. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. <laughs> Honey, you have no idea how foolish you're speaking. You have no idea how foolishly you're speaking. That is, that is the worst possible mindset you could ever have. You need the body of Christ. You need the body of Christ. Trust me, you need the body of Christ. Now, corporate worship. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation or should be in operation in the church. And these gifts operate when we come together corporately. Mm -hmm. God don't use tongues and interpretation when you're in your prayer closet. I've actually heard people say that, and I think you've got to be out of your mind. That is not what the Word of God says. God does not use prophecy. I'm going to tell you something. I have given some, I've prophesied, let me use that term. I have prophesied in prayer meetings. Prayer meetings. And while we were all kneeling at the altar at the front of the church, you know, there was probably 20, 30 people there at First United Pentecostal Church in East Texas. And we're all praying. All of a sudden, God put a word of prophecy, and I began to prophesy at a prayer meeting. We weren't even in a church service. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into details about that specific prophecy. I never spoke a truer prophecy in my life. Let me tell you right now. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Because the Lord warned us and said, the enemy's about to open up every weapon against you that you can ever imagine. He said, you are about to go through a barrage like you have never experienced. And you know what? It wasn't two months, three months later that I experienced what I experienced that wound up causing me to come out. Went through one of the hardest things, brother, I've ever been through in my life. I mean, and believe me, when it came about, I remembered every word I prophesied. But that word went for me alone. I guarantee you there were others that probably got hit with similar, you know, uh, difficulties. But the gifts of the Spirit are supposed to be in operation. Listen, somebody say, well, bless God, they aren't in operation in my church. Then you need to find another church. Don't not go to church. Mm -hmm. right. Find you another church. Yeah. One of the things that thrills my soul, as small as our little church is, Laura, the thing that makes me happy, we can have folks come from Waco, Texas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Drive a hundred miles to come to our church. They must pass a hundred Pentecostal churches on their way to our little church. And they say, oh, but there's something here that I don't find anywhere else I've been. There's something here I haven't experienced anywhere else. I've been looking for a pastor full of the Holy Ghost. I've been looking for a church where the anointing is present. I've been looking for a place where the gifts of the Spirit are in operation. Amen. Well, tell you, it, it, let me tell you, it, it, it doesn't take an IQ in the 200s to know that our little church got something good going on for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Corporate worship is a divine function. It is a divine function. It's literally like the vision that Ezekiel had of the Valley of Dry Bones. It's literally the body pulling itself together, so to speak. And when the body comes together, God is mystically, divinely able to do things with and within the body that He cannot do when we are scattered and separate. As members of one body, we must interact and we must learn to function efficiently as a body. Courtship, uh, courtship. I'm going to have another one of them Tuesdays where I'm talking in tongues all the time. Corporate worship provides opportunity for the weak to be held up by the strong. Mm -hmm. It provides opportunity for the healing process to carry out its function as one part of the body 
responds to the needs and afflictions of other members of that same body. Amen. One cannot possibly worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness without separating themselves from the world and uniting with others of like precious faith. That's right. An arm cannot live and function alone without being connected to the rest of the body. It is during times of corporate worship that God is able to communicate to His body as all the members are present and unified. The gifts of the Spirit are designed to benefit the church as a body. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. And not just members individually. That's what Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians. Therefore, for the gifts to function properly, they must operate within the confines and environment of the corporate body of Christ. That's right. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 12. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, meaning everybody, the entirety of the body. The manifestation of the Spirit is not given to profit an individual. That's right. It is given to profit the entirety of the body. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severely as he will. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Mm -hmm. So God marries, listen to me now, God marries the notion of the unity of the corporate body of Christ with the gifts of the Spirit. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness mm -hmm. have mercy. Mm -hmm. Get people that can't find victory, get people that struggle with sickness and illness and all kinds of demonic attacks and they can't seem to get the victory well part of the problem is that you're not uniting with the body of Christ so that God can divinely act on your behalf that's right trust me it works I know what I'm talking about there are times the enemy comes against my body y'all don't have any clue some of the things I've been through just in the last eight years or so I, they just told me recently I'm diabetic. Well, for years and years and years, I was struggling with things apparently related to that. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it, I literally was contemplating giving up ministry. Because, Laura, I was so fatigued all the time. I was struggling so, Tommy can tell you, I could hardly get out of bed. And I don't mean... For a day or two. I'm talking about for year after year after year. I struggled for the last several years. Then when they finally got the diabetes issue figured out, and they put me on insulin and all the doctors said, well, you should be feeling a lot better real soon. I wasn't. And I told the doctor, I said, doctor, I'm telling you, I'm still... I'm still so exhausted. I'm still so fatigued. I can't stand it. I said, my God... Honestly, there are times I, I just really, I just about want to die. I don't want to kill myself, but I, but I just, I was, it's so hard, Laura, to wake up in the morning and try to, to live. Mm -hmm. That's how much of a battle I've gone through in the last eight years, literally. Mm -hmm. Doctor said, we need to check your thyroid. 
checks my thyroid she said oh boy there's your problem she said your thyroid is very inactive she said we've got to get you on some thyroid medication put me on the thyroid medication and within two or three days boom I felt like a new man but I was wrestling and you know what brother for everything I was going through and I get people in our movement who pick me to pieces chew me up spit me out I was faithful to my calling. I did what God called me to do. I was here on Tuesday. I was here on Thursday. I was here on, on Sunday. There were times out of that period of time we were doing two services on Sunday. And a nursing home. And a nursing home. I'd be doing the nursing home before I was able to get Brother Jack to take it over. Say, Pastor, I don't understand why you're not more understanding of people who are struggling. I'll tell you why. <laughs> Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. I, I have a very hard time with excuses. I really do. I can't, anything I can't stand is people that constantly fill my ear with excuses. I sit there and I've, I've said to Tommy in private, I said, you know, well, so-and-so said, oh, I didn't feel well. I didn't get to go to church because I didn't feel well. Mm -hmm. I went to church and I felt like my body was dying. Literally, I'm not joking. And you know what? We started worshiping the Lord. We started praying. And Laura, I felt a whole lot better going home than I did when I went. Got home and spent another six or eight hours working on the video to get it posted online. Stayed up till six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning on Monday to get Sunday sermon posted online. Oh, Pastor, you're so wonderful. That's not why I'm saying all this. I'm trying to tell you today corporate worship is a divine function I know that trust me I know that I know that there have been I grew up in Pentecost I couldn't tell you how many times that I was sick or I was struggling psychologically mentally you know battling depression battling fatigue whatever the case might be and I knew Laura if I could get to the house of God <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. If I could get to church, it would change. My situation would change. And it did. And it did. How can your gifts benefit the corporate body of Christ if you are not connected to the body? How can the gifts of others benefit you if you're not connected to the body? I told you the story the other day of a man in the church I grew up in and he literally, God would use him over and over and over and over and over again with what is referred to as a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. I'm going to tell you something folks. These TV preachers you see running around doing their dog and pony shows, that is not how the gifts of the Spirit operate. That's right. The gifts of the Spirit often operate in a very subtle very uh, very fluid but very subtle manner yes. I told you how one couple I knew the, the man was divorced and he had remarried and this is back in the day when divorce and remarriage my goodness there honey that was right up there with homosexuality trust me it really was mm -hmm. oh if you were divorced and remarried I'm telling you the church looked down on you like there was no looking down and he would be used by the pastor sometimes to lead the worship, you know. Oh no, some of the great sanctified members of our church, they weren't going to have that. Oh, we can't have that divorcee up there leading the worship. He was one of the sweetest, most dedicated men you ever knew. Precious, precious saint of God. Oh, but so many people set in judgment of him because he's divorced or remarried. Didn't matter whether the divorce was before or after conversion either, by the way, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Didn't matter if you were saved before you divorced or after you divorced. If you were divorced, period, that's all there was to it. Well, he and his wife were on the verge of leaving the Pentecostal movement, literally, because everywhere you went was the same thing. And they were seriously contemplating going to a more liberal, kind of
kind of mainstream, you know, church and high high church. That was a little more lenient when it came to divorce and remarriage. They were seriously contemplating making that move. And Brother Cecil Obar walked over to them one Sunday and he said, and he used to do this all the time, and he'd always start the same way, I don't know why <laughs> that God spoke this to me. Because he didn't know why. He had no idea. He said, I don't know why. He said, but the Lord spoke something to my spirit to tell you. He said, and, and I want to tell you what God told me. And so they looked at him and said, okay. And Brother Obar said, set your anchor. That's what God told me. Set your anchor. Don't make a move. Set your anchor. The storm will blow over. You just need to ride out the storm. Well, brother and sister star, had that witness of the Holy Ghost. Because when you hear a word of wisdom or you hear a word of knowledge and it's real, you'll receive the witness. You'll know in your heart, whoo, I just heard God. And they received the witness in their spirit that God was speaking at them. And they talked amongst themselves and they said, well, I guess the Lord telling us we need to stay where we're at. So they stayed. And sister star said years later, she said, one of my daughters, she had some beautiful daughters. One of my daughters married a Pentecostal preacher. The other one married and became a Pentecostal missionary. She said, what would have been different? What could have changed if we had made a move? She said, now I look back. Let me tell you, that word out of the mouth of Cecil Obar was priceless. But they'd have never heard it if they weren't in church that Sunday. That's right. I'm going to tell you a little secret. There are often times, I've learned this over the years, I've been preaching an awful long time. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've heard people say, Pastor, when you were talking about thus and so this week, I literally had just asked that question. I literally was just talking to somebody about that. I literally just had that thought go through my head. And and I remember when I was a kid, I'd be sitting into the listening to the preacher preach, and sometimes a thought would go through my head, you know, I'd think, well, what, 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 what about so and so? And all of a sudden, Brother Babcock, I'll, I'll never forget as long as I live, he'd say, and some of you are thinking, what about such and so? <laughs> <laughs> how did he do that look at the ministry of Jesus how often does the word of God say and he knowing their thoughts he responded to things they didn't say but they were thinking a word of knowledge it doesn't mean the pastor is psychic Right. It doesn't mean he knows your thoughts. But what it does mean is that God allows him access to knowledge he would not otherwise have. That's right. That's a word of knowledge. And he's speaking from a, a place in the Spirit. God is allowing him. Somebody's saying such and so. <laughs> somebody's asking this question. Somebody's asking that question. And the pastor knows it. He knows somebody's asking that question. And when he said, some of you are thinking, I've done it myself. And had people come to me after church and say, it was like you're psychic. That thought literally just went through my head and no sooner did that thought go through my head, you turned around and said, some of you are thinking. Or some of you are asking. Or maybe this weekend I was visiting with a friend and we were talking about some things and lo and behold, by God, if in this message today, you didn't hit on every single thing we were talking about. It's like you were sitting in on the conversation. Honey, that is the gifts of the Spirit in operation. But see, it's, it's very subtle. That's not a word of knowledge where somebody comes to you and says, hey, i got a word for you. But it's still a word of knowledge. Sometimes the preacher gets up there and he'll say, you know, somebody's going through such and such and this and that. And 
The Spirit is saying, you need to do thus and so. You need to do... And what they're doing is they're giving you a word of wisdom. They're imparting wisdom. They're telling you the wise response, God's response to this situation. I told you years ago when I was in Brother Gillum's church in Fort Worth, my mother came to Texas. She left my father after 20-some years of marriage, and she came to Texas. And my father called her boo-hoo, and then, oh, woe was me. My father didn't like, if he, as long as he left her, everything would be fine. But he wants to be in control. Oh, he'd give her a big song and a dance. He just wanted to control the situation. And I tried to tell her she wouldn't listen to him. She made her mind up, bless God, she's going to go back. He's going to do right. He's going to act right. He's, he's, he said he wants to do the right thing. I said, Mother, you're going right back to the same old mess. No, you need to come with me because he said he wants to do right as a father. And I said, hey, you go. God called me to Texas. Sayonara. I'm staying right where I'm at. I came to Texas without her. I didn't. My being in Texas didn't have nothing to do with her being in Texas. I mean, she came because I was here. But in other words, God called me and I came. So, you know, I said, you do whatever you want to do. I'm not going back. Well, man, I'm telling you, she and I wound up in a tug of war for about a week. Finally, I went to Brother Gillum. And I said, Brother Gillum, I don't know what to do. My mother's just having a fit. She wants me to go back with her to Connecticut. And I said, oh, I don't want to go. I don't want anything to do with that. Blah, 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 blah. And Brother Gillum looked at me and he said, Chuck, son, he said, you need to go back with your mother. He said, go with her. He said, but if God wants you back, he'll bring you back. And he'll make a way for you to come back. He said, but you know what? Don't let this become something between you and your mom. Don't let this become a big divide between you and your mother. He said, you go with her and then let God work out the details. And, and he knows you're not going because you're trying to disobey him. He knows you're going because you're trying to keep peace in your family. And you know, when Brother Yom said those words, oh, I felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost come over me. All of a sudden, this peace hit me out of the clear blue. Now, I've been in turmoil for a week, and I mean turmoil over this issue. All of a sudden, this peace come over me, brother. Mm -hmm. I didn't respond to Brother Gillum by saying, Well, but brother, I might get stuck up there, brother. Things might not work out. Oh, but you know, think about it. you plan on coming back, but you can't come back. But I, no, 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 no. What he spoke to me was a word of wisdom. That was God communicating to me. This is the manner with which I would have you to respond to this situation. And because that peace come over my spirit, just the minute Brother Gillum spoke those words, I knew it was from God, and therefore, I didn't have all the negative thoughts. I didn't have the, well, but what if, and what, oh, this could happen, or that could happen. None of those thoughts even entered my mind, because I had the peace of God come over me. I knew, hey, this is God talking. And if the Lord's telling me, go, and I'll bring you back, if I want you back, I knew he wanted me back. So in essence, I knew God would make a way for me to come back. Long story short, it's exactly what happened. You know how it happened? Talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Talking about how God uses corporate worship. How God uses our corporate gatherings, okay? That's the body of Christ. I go back to Connecticut with my mother. The pastor of the Assembly of God Church that I attended as a young man growing up uh, was on vacation and we had a visiting preacher coming in. The visiting preacher's name was Nori. And Brother Kogel had not been in our church since I was, I think my mother said, about like seven months old or so. He left our church to, to go into his ministry when I was about seven. And he had not been back to our church in literally 16 years. About, about six, 15 and a half, 16 years. He didn't know me from Jack the Ripper. Last time he saw me, I was cradled in my mother's arms. He didn't know me. Nori's going to preach Sunday night, Sunday morning, and Wednesday night in Brother Harmon's absence. So he preaches Sunday morning. 
they have a little dinner for him, you know, because he was a favorite son, so to speak. So they had a little, you know, fellowship dinner for him afterwards. Uh, Sunday night, Brother Nori Kokel is preaching. And he gets down off the platform and he's talking and he's preaching and he's walking down the center aisle, you know. And he gets about here and I'm sitting right here. Second pew back on the right hand side inside aisle. That was my spot. He gets just past me, so I don't even see him. I'm sitting there, got my Bible on my lap. I'm looking at my Bible. I'm listening to him. I don't even see what happens. My mother told me afterwards. She said, all of a sudden, Nori put the microphone under his arm like this. He swung around and slapped his hands on my head. Nearly gave me a whiplash. I didn't even know it was coming. I didn't see him. So all of, a, boom, all of a sudden I got hands on my head. And that man began to prophesy. I've called this young man. He's going to preach things and people are going to call him insane. That's what he prophesied. He said, but I put my words in his mouth. He said, and when I tell him to do something, he does what I tell him to do. And he prophesied there were three things that I had told my family over the years that the Lord had shown me about my calling and about my ministry. One of those things was one time I was a young man, maybe 12 or 13, and, and I was telling the Lord, Lord, I don't know how you could call me to preach. I don't know how you could use me. I've told you before, between the ages of 8 and 16, I had a horrible, horrible nervous condition. People thought I had Tourette syndrome. The only thing I didn't do was yell out cusses, thank God. <laughs> but I had literally, I had ticks. I'm not kidding. This is what I look like. For eight years of my life, God called me to preach when I was eight. The minute God called me, it was like Satan took my father over and he went into overdrive, tried to destroy me. And my father, my nerves just went right out the window. I begged my mother to take me to a doctor because I, I was made fun of mercilessly, mercilessly in school. Begged my mother to take me to a doctor. Now, wasn't important enough, I guess, to her. Finally, when I was about... I think 14 or so she took me to our family doctor and you know my my family doctor was trying to talk to me and my mother kept jumping in and interjecting and finally he looked at her and he said no. would you get out of this room let me talk to him by himself that's what he said Dr. Donnie I'll never forget as long as I wanted to kiss him she left the room he talked to me he calls her back in the room. He said, you need to get this boy to a doctor. He is abused. This kid is abused. This child's nerves are shot. I won't go into what my mother's reaction was. All right, so, so he don't know what he's talking about. That's what my mother's reaction was. So you know how much help I got? None. None. I said, Lord, how can you use me? Look at me. How can you use me? There's no way. How could you call me to preach? How in the world am I going to get in a pulpit and preach? Woo! <laughs> he said, open your Bible. I did. It fell open to Jeremiah chapter 1. And I looked down and I began to read. Before I formed thee in thy mother's womb, I knew thee. I've called you to be a prophet unto the nations. I've ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Say not that I am a child, for I put my words in your mouth. <laughs> Do you know what Nori's prophecy began with that night? Before I formed thee in thy mother's womb. And he literally quoted those very verses. As a young man, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what kind of ministry am I going to have? He said, you're going to have a prophetic ministry. I didn't know what that meant. Sometimes I don't think I still do. I said, well, who in the Bible has a ministry that 
I can look at it and kind of understand what, what you're talking about. He said, John the Baptist. Your ministry will be like that of John the Baptist. Now, I had told my grandmother, I told my aunts and uncles, I told my mother, all three of these saints. God used Jeremiah 1 before I formed thee in thy mother's womb. God used, he told me I was going to have a prophetic ministry to be like that of John the Baptist. Those three points. You know what Nori Kogel's prophecy was? Before I formed thee in thy mother's womb, he quotes the first part of uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. From there he goes into, I've called you to a prophetic ministry. From there he goes into, just like John the Baptist. He hit all three. All three, all three of those points. We come out of the church that night, God in the car to go home. You, you ain't never saw my mother so quiet. <laughs> my mother said, you're going back to Texas if I've got to pay your way myself. <laughs> she knew I wasn't kidding, and I wasn't. When I said at 16 years old, God called me to Texas, I wasn't joking, Laura. I was not just trying to get out of my father's house. I wouldn't have, None of those thoughts even crossed my mind, to be honest with you. When the Lord spoke to me and said, go to Texas, it scared the death out of me. I didn't. You know, I was like, go to Texas? What are you, crazy? I've never, been, I've never lived a mile away from home, never mind 1,600 miles away. But you know what happened for me? I got off the plane at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. February 12, 1982. And I was delivered from that nervous condition. It never has come back. And I didn't even know I was delivered until my Aunt Dorothy and I were sitting at Denny's. And after a couple of hours, she said to me, Chuck, last summer when I was up home, because she'd come up to Connecticut every summer, she said, you still have that nervous condition you've had since you were a kid. She said, when did it go away? Because she had just seen me back in August, and here it is February. It's been six months or so, right? She said, when did it go? I said, it hasn't gone away. She said, oh, yes, it has. She said, I've been sitting here now. You were in my car driving from the airport back to Fort Worth. We've been sitting here at Denny's eating for the last hour. She said, you hadn't twitched once. You hadn't blinked your eyes once. You hadn't done none of that head stuff once. I jumped up off that table. I ran into the bathroom and literally looked at myself in the mirror and stood there just watching, waiting, <laughs> waiting, waiting. I'm telling you, when God speaks to you, if you'll obey, you don't know what miracles He has in store for you. Amen. You don't know what miracles God... That's why it, it disturbs me. I know dozens of people that God has spoken to come to this church. I do. I know dozens of people. I've had people call me from all over the country. The Spirit of the Lord told me to go to Dallas and be part of your church. I said, come on. Do they? Nope. But I know, based on my own experience, that if they'd obey the voice of God, Laura, I know, they probably get the best job they ever had. They'd probably make more money than they ever made. They'd probably be more blessed than they've ever been if they would obey the voice of God. God doesn't tell you to do something unless He has something planned for you. When He told me to go to Texas, at 16, if I'd have ignored what God told me to do, I'd probably still have that condition today. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. So, yes. worship, corporate worship, the gifts of the Spirit functioning, this is all... Honey, there, there is no substitute for corporate worship. There is no substitute for coming together with God's people. There's no substitute. God could not do what He did to reveal to my mother. Oh, let me tell you something else. <laughs> I had some family members. I'm going to tell you something. You want to get people ticked off at you, let God call you to preach. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The Bible said events enemies be those of his own household, didn't he? Man, I had some good sanctified aunts. 
had nothing better to do than pick me to pieces, pull me apart. I mean, find every fault and put them under a microscope and let me know there was no way in the universe God could call you to preach. There ain't no way God could ever use you to preach. Why, well, look at you. You do this wrong. You do that wrong. This ain't right with you. That, of course, I'm just a kid. Mm -hmm. I got news for you. Called or not, a kid's going to be a kid. That's right. Brother Jack, I, I had one out in particular. Oh, she used to tear me up, still does to this day. Of course, now she got new reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Guess who was sitting in that service that night? <laughs> every single one. Every single member of my family was in that church that night. Every aunt, every uncle, my grandmother, everybody. You know why? So I'm going to show you how God works. God knows how to do it and do it right. Mm -hmm. Because every one of them had grown up with Nori in church. Mm -hmm. And everybody wanted to come hear him and see him. Mm -hmm. They didn't know he's going to turn around and prophesy over me and repeat everything I'd ever told them about what God had told me about my calling. They didn't know that. But they hit him right between the eyes. <laughs> and my one aunt said, oh, well, I guess I'm going to keep my mouth shut from now on. <laughs> I'm telling you, there is nothing in the world, folks, nothing that can even come close to what God does in corporate worship. When we come together as a body, doors are open to the Lord doing things that you cannot even fathom. Things that He cannot and will not do one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Because that's not the way He's designed it to work. Mm -hmm. You want to see the power of God move in our community? You want to see revival? I know why the enemy works so hard at constantly, constantly trying to tear away at the membership of this church. We get good folks that start coming to church. Good people. I mean, these are good, solid, good people. Brother Jack, they come for a year, they come for two, whatever. They, you know, several months, whatever. All of a sudden, boom, they disappear. We don't even know why they're gone. They don't say a word. They give us no explanation. We don't see them. We don't hear from them. Try to send them an email. They don't respond. Try to call them. They don't answer. Text them. They don't answer. And I know why the devil does this. He wants to make sure that this body of believers and this little church never get of one accord in one place. So oh, no, 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 no. Because guess what's going to happen? All heaven's going to break loose. Revival's going to come down on the LGBT community. And all of a sudden, you're going to find out there are LGBT people, honey, who know how to live holy. There are LGBT people who know how to pray. There are LGBT people that God can use and God can bless. And He does not want the church to see this. That's why I try to tell people, listen, I've been pioneering starting churches for an awful long time. This is literally, I'm not saying every work I've tried to do has been successful. I, I'm the first preacher going, listen, I don't get up here and blow a bunch of smoke. I don't get up here and tell fibs about myself. I have a problem with preachers that do and I know lots of them that do. To hear them tell it, everything they've ever done was stellar. No, I've gone into communities and tried to do a work and it didn't work. Jesus said when that happens, you shake the dust off your clothes and you move on. So obviously if he said that this can happen, it can happen. Mm -hmm. You're not always going to be successful. You're not always going to succeed at every venture. You know, uh, even when you're doing it for the Lord. Your ministry may not fit a certain community. Your ministry may not speak to a certain place. But if you go up the road 10 miles, guess what? It will there. So you need to be in the right place. Don't waste your time in the wrong place. Make sure you're in the right place. Shake the dust off your clothes. Move on. Keep moving until you find the right place. I've been in Dallas 14 years. I spent almost half that time in New York City. Doing the same thing I'm doing here, folks. Baptized dozens of LGBT people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. 
but we could never get a work established. We could never get it. Mm -mm. People, they come, they went. And I've tried to explain to people, I've said it I don't know how many times. Folks, if you're going to be part of a new work, you have to be committed to it. You have to be. You have to be. Yeah. A new work cannot function like a church that's been around for many years. Yeah. Where you can come and go as you please and you know you can be as faithful as you feel like being. It, it doesn't work when you're trying to do a new work. Mm -hmm. When you're doing a new work, you need everybody in their place every time. That's how it works. And trust me, you get that going mm -hmm. and you'll see things start to happen. My first church, I've told you and then i got to shut up because we're after 9 o'clock. <laughs> My first church, we started the first Sunday. I had 13 people. I believe it was plus myself. I'm not sure. It might have been including myself. Show up. Including two children. Eight of those people came to me after the service and said, would you be our full-time pastor? After the first service. My very first church. Let me tell you something. You want to talk about faithful people? I had a man, he and his wife were starting a new business, a Christian bookstore, and the Catholic Church had put out word to boycott their bookstore because they sold materials that were not, still, you know, very kind about Catholicism. This poor guy was struggling like crazy to get that bookstore off the ground. He worked hour after hour after hour after he got off work at Sikorsky Helicopter Factory. He went to the bookstore work. His wife was at the bookstore all day. They had two children. Never missed a church service. Never missed Sunday school. Never missed Tuesday night Bible study. Never, back then we used to do Tuesday night Bible study, Thursday night evangelistic service. They were there literally every single service. I speak their names in honor to them. Sue and Leo Raskowski. Never missed a service. That's the level of dedication we had. And it was true of every member I had. When we had church, those eight people plus two children were going to be there. If nobody else was there, brother, they were going to be there. And for the first three or four months, I was mad at God because it seemed like that's all we were going to have. Now, I'd give God, I'd give anything to have eight or ten people I could count on to be there every time. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Mm -hmm. I'd even take the two babies. <laughs> <clears throat> but you know what? After a few months, we had, I mean, we had a couple start coming, you know, as well. But anyway, after about five months or so, that thing literally just started to grow. And every single Sunday, we gained new members. We couldn't have people visit our church, but they wanted to come there. Everybody that visited wanted to come to our church. Uh, very few people would visit and not return. Very few. Since I've been doing LGBT, it's the opposite. It's the exact opposite. Now we get 9 out of 10, we never see them again. Back then it was 9 out of 10 stayed and 1 out of 10 didn't. Now it's 9 out of 10 don't and 1 out of 10 do. But I'm here to tell you today, folks, corporate worship is a divine function. Mm -hmm. The gifts of the Spirit are designed to operate in a corporate environment. God cannot do for you the way God wants to do for you unless you do things God's way. And God's way is His people come together. They come together in fellowship. They come together in prayer. They come together to worship. And when God's people come together, you will be shocked at what God can do. All right, amen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. It's after nine. We've got to break down and get out of here before these people throw us out. Father, we love you, God, tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for this time and this place. We thank you for the word of God and the truth of God, which is able, Lord, to liberate and heal and help us. We pray, Lord, tonight that that which is spoken would speak to our hearts, not just to our mind. Lord, let it not be empty words that fall across our hearing, but let it today, God, be liberating truth that speaks to our spirit and encourages us, Lord, to find a new path to walk upon. Master, help us to do right. 
Help us, Lord, to choose the way of righteousness. Help us to be a witness and a testimony for you. We ask it all in that sacred name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you and amen.